This is pure Hollywood. A man rushing into battle, expressing every bit of his machismo to the point where he's yelling his own name at his enemies. Right? Wrong. James Douglas was born sometime in the 13th century. We don't know what year. He was the eldest son of the noble William Douglas, who was the first nobleman to actually side with William Wallace during the fighting. Now, as a young man, he would have been trained the use of arms, meaning he would have been an expert in a sword, javelin, spear, riding a horse, by the time he was a fully grown man. Now, his father sent him off to France for safety. Um, during the war and independence inside of Scotland. Now, my personal opinion is his father knew the intense rage that Douglas had inside of him and sent him away, knowing that if he and Wallace lost and were captured, that would have a fire inside of his son that would eventually consume the English, which is pretty much exactly what happened. So James returned to Scotland in the 1300s and personally asked Edward I for his lands back that had been confiscated from his father William during the war. His father William died in the Tower of London in 1298 as a prisoner of war. When Edward found out who J son James was, he was furious and cast him out. He actually said that he never wanted to hear the name Douglas again. After this, he created one of the worst enemies he would ever have. Now, the reason why you don't understand why he was so upset, as I've talked about previously in the um, Aftermath of Evesham video, link up here if you guys want to watch that one, disinheriting your barons turned them into your worst enemies, and here's why. Like I said, James was a nobleman and he was trained for war. Now, if you took away his land, he had nothing else to live by. He had no other means with which to supply for himself or to have a family. He was an outcast, and basically, you turned him from a nobleman to a bum. Uh, no offense against people who are homeless, but that's what he was now. He was homeless and landless. So, now, there's also a war kicking off inside of Scotland. Now, Edward did not know there was a war kicking off at the time, because hostilities had just ended, and the last people who were resisting him had surrendered. However, by doing the disinheritance, much like his father did previously, and created several enemies, he had done the same thing, but with a much deadlier foe. People do not know who James was, but they were about to find out. So anyway, James, now a homeless noble, but good for him, Robert the Bruce started a rebellion against England. So, with nothing to lose, he rode right up to Robert the Bruce on a hill, got off his horse, dismounted, took out his sword, and pledged his loyalty to him in return for his lands. Yes, that really happened. That's exactly how they met. And he would indeed stay loyal to Robert throughout all his triumphs, and throughout, at first, his deadly failure. The rebellion started off with two major defeats, both of which were partially fought of Robert the Bruce. The first was a defeat by the English, and the second was a defeat by the Scots, the MacDougals. The Scots fought each other a whole lot. Uh, however, both times, Robert, sorry, both times, James was in the thick of the fighting, keeping his word to Robert the Bruce, and fighting ferociously against all his enemies, tearing into him, and, you know, spilling their guts and their blood onto the field. After fleeing to northern Scotland, rebuilding their forces and training themselves a new warfare, training themselves a new army, the type of warfare changed. No longer would they be using static warfare, but they would be using guerrilla warfare, and this is where they begin to shine. Now, they split into two split their forces into two groups. Robert raided the northern part of Scotland, and Douglas raided the southern part of Scotland, Douglasdale. After all, they were his own lands, much closer to home, so he had a much more personal reason to do this. One of Douglas' favorite tricks that he would like to do is pretend to be cows. He and his men would dress up like cows, either putting dirt on themselves, or probably actually covering themselves in cow hides, and bend down and crawl around all day. The reason they would crawl around all day is because, as everyone who loves history knows, taking a small amount of men and rushing to a castle and trying to smash it open is stupid. It's ludicrous. It very, very, very seldom works that way. It doesn't work. Even if you outnumber the people inside a castle, it's unlikely for you to smash inside the castle and take it. There's one account where one woman and five men held off against an army of 500 and killed 105 of them as they attacked it. Yeah, castles were very defensive. That's what they were built for. They were built so small numbers could hold off against much larger numbers. However, Douglas would prove to be the exception to the rule by using small numbers and taking much larger castles. Like I said, their favorite trick was to pretend they would be cows, and when they would wait out all day, when nightfall came, they would walk up close to the castle, climb over the castle, go inside, and slaughter people while they were sleeping. The raid that led the English to fear Douglas was called the du was named the Douglas Dale by the Scottish. On March 19, 1307, James Douglas, with the help of Thomas Dickinson, who was a former vassal of his father, helped James sneak into the castle while most of the garrison was in was at were inside of church. James walked inside and massacred most of the garrison, but he didn't stop there. He took the prisoners of the rest, had them beheaded, piled their heads together, and lit them on fire. When the relief force came through the through the castle weeks later on, they saw they were appalled by the horror they saw of their troops being slaughtered by an enemy that they could not see, but whose name they knew and who they felt could be watching them at any time. This struck terror into the hearts of the English and nicknamed him the Black 
Douglas. Douglas continued to fight the English and develop as a military commander. Much like the son of Tancred, some of my favorite warriors from history, he, James would pick a strong defensive position and refuse to move from it. He would not fight the enemy on their terms, he would force them to fight on his terms. James also was not the king, so he was allowed to lead his troops from the front. This also inspired them to rush into battle. Some would say Douglas would subject himself to danger foolishly, but in reality, he was subjecting the English to his vengeance and to his wrath. As he did at the Battle of Bannockburn, once again leading from the front in 1314, where he, Robert the Bruce, and their fellow Scottish men dealt the English a historic defeat, utterly crushing Edward II's troops and sending them home. Now, some could question the authenticity of Douglas' heroic antics. After all, he is the, he, his heroic antics are written by Scottish writers who could be biased. So therefore, you'll be just in thinking, did this guy really do all this? But I think you have to look at the difference between Douglas and the English soldiers he was fighting. Now, the troops Douglas were facing were certainly not pushovers, but there was a difference between the, behind the intentions of the men fighting and... The, sorry, but there were differences between the intentions of the men Douglas was fighting and Douglas and the Scots themselves. Douglas and the Scots were fighting for their land and for their freedom. They had, like I said before, nothing to lose. Whereas the English soldier, you know, he was battalion. He had, battalions had to be raised, bears had to be called upon, taxes had to be raised, they had to be paid, they had to go up north to fight some enemy way up north. Now... They did have the advantage of defeating Wallace at Falkirk, but that was a pitched battle. That was their type of fight, and also Edward I was leading them. And let's not forget, they had the Welsh longbowmen with them. That played a major factor inside of that battle. Rather than turning it into a long slugfest, it turned to a decisive victory for the English. Now, later at this point, Edward I had died and was not able to engage in battle with Douglas. That's a huge what if for me in history. What would have happened if Douglas and Edward had fought each other? Two guys just, you know, going for the juggler at each other. I would have... You know, that would have been something interesting to see. But it didn't happen. So, fuel for the soldier in England would be money or irritation because he has to go up there to fight if he doesn't want to. And for Douglas, it's rage, vengeance, and freedom. And, you know, a lot of people argue about, well, Scottish didn't have this nationalist idea in their head. Maybe they did not. But nonetheless, just take Douglas himself. I'm not talking about everybody. Douglas himself was a man who had everything taken away from him. And the person who would take it from him was in his way. You're giving him a fight that he actually not only can fight, but a fight that he wants to fight. The last type of fight where they were fighting guerrilla warfare was in 1283. So by 1307, a lot of those veterans would either be very old or probably dead. The new troops would be coming up would be much younger troops. If they had fought against Wallace on his campaign, like I said, that saw a major pitched battle. Not the type of fight Douglas was fighting against the English. Not only that, they were fighting an enemy who really wanted to terrify them, who had terrified them, and they were fighting a man who wanted to defeat them in his own backyard. It wasn't somebody who was like, I'm going to fight you in a battle, then I'm going to talk peace terms. No, no, I'm going to terrorize you as much as I can, to I'm going to keep on bleeding you bit by bit till you can barely move, and then I'm going to crush you and just steamroll you. It's a completely different kind of opponent they were facing inside of Douglas. And if Edward did come, I doubt Douglas would have fought him at in a pitch battle unless he had all the advantage and Edward being smart probably wouldn't have engaged with Douglas so he probably would have kept going back and forth much like Caesar and Pompey did. Final interesting fact for Douglas, he is the one of the few Scottish warriors to fight three Edwards. That's right, he fought Edward I, not technically he engaged with his troops. Uh, when Edward marched north to fight him, he died on the way there, as you all know. So he didn't engage with him on the battlefield personally, but he did fight his troops while Edward I was still alive. He also fought Edward II on the same battlefield at Bannockburn. And he fought Edward III, yes, Edward, whose son became the Black Prince, the Edward who reclaimed most of the lands in um, France for the Plantagenet dynasty. That guy. Douglas defeated him. Uh, what happened was, after Edward II died, the young Edward III took about 15,000 troops up north to try to reclaim lands in Scotland, and Douglas stuck true to his guns. He had the defensive position, refused to give the English battle. He retreated away from them to an even stronger defensive position that the English still want to attack him at, to decide to make camp and wait around him. While they made their camp and decided to sleep in their bed, Douglas said, hey, they're sleeping, let's go get them. He unleashed upon them, no doubt screaming Douglas at the top of his lungs, hurling himself into them, and left him in a bloody mess. He's, um, oh, more than 500 to, you know, 600 English were slaughtered. A lot of people say those are high numbers. I doubt. I don't think they're too high because Douglas had between 100 and 200 men with them. Each guy killing, you know, two guys while they're in their sleep. Um, that does not seem hard to me at all. He actually probably killed more than that. I personally believe so. Personally, he probably killed five rather than, you know, two or three each. Because, remember, you had, you had to put your armor on. That took a minute. There's a reason you had a squire to assist you. So, you're we're not picturing knights at the ready who Douglas was fighting, you know, yeah, there were some guys who were awake, definitely, but a lot of them were probably sleeping, so they wouldn't have been in their full body armor. As a matter of fact, uh, Edward III fled in a boat, um, half naked or stark naked at least, from the field of battle, so he clearly wasn't ready to fight, and he probably wasn't the only noble who was not dressed for a war combat accordingly. So, yeah, Douglas fought three Edwards, made a name for himself, terrified the English, 
fought Guerrilla Warfare. Hero for the Scots. Thanks for watching.